with the less daunting number seven on his back, that New York's love affair with Mickey Mantle began. In his first 14 seasons, the Yanks went to 12 World Series, winning seven. A powerful switch hitter with blinding speed, Mantle was at his best in the mid-50s. In 1956, he won the first of his consecutive MVP awards, as well as the Triple Crown. At a time when television brought baseball into the living room, Mantle was a star of stars. The magnificent Mickey, just 20 years old, has a liner to left center for base hit. Here comes Mickey with a rounding third, coming in to score. Mantle backing up and makes the catch. That ball is going, going, it is gone. Yankee Stadium, Madison Avenue, Main Street. The Mick was popular everywhere. Women loved him, men admired him, and every kid wanted to grow up to be just like him. If you're gonna build a baseball player from scratch, you'd go, just forget the plans, him. Just make it him. He could do everything. He was so fast. The power was amazing. When you're a little kid, you went, oh my God. It was a comet with a hat on. There was a fury. There was an explosiveness that was very, very appealing. Mantle brought an energy and just brought a wildness to the plate. Mantle's at bats were explosions. Boom! Mantle belts it over the fence in right field. The ball would go. Yeah. And there it goes for Bedford Avenue and deep into a parking lot. What was sort of ironic is that occasionally he would lay down a bunt. Mantle's speed was part of what Mantle was. I mean, he was extraordinary getting down to first base, getting around the bases. You just count sometimes how great a fielder he was. Mickey outran the ball. He was that fast. Take the base here. I'd rather lead the league in uh, runs batted in, home runs, and hitting. And that's my goal for this year. He was such a leader, it picked you up as a team. You know you could never be on his level. But, buddy, I'm going to tell you one thing you tried. You broke your fanny trying to equal him. He was one of those players who wasn't just good. It made you feel good to just watch him. There's talent, but then there's just his raw presence. First of all, he looked like he was from Central Casting. He was dashing, he was handsome. And he was graceful. He had a boyish look about him all the time and a great smile and he smiled a lot. You saw Mickey Mantle and you liked him. The all shucks part of his personality was very endearing. When I come up to the big leagues, I was a shuffling, grinning, head-ducking country boy. But that charming drawl, that country boy bullshit is, was great, you know. And he was absolutely ripped. He stretched those pinstripes to their limits in his upper body. And no steroids. He didn't need steroids. In fact, we didn't know how to spell it back then. He was the first person that you saw in your life who was bigger than life. Mantle and Wheaties, they're still a team. Hey, hey, hey! He's on his way. He'd be on everything. He'd be here, he'd be there. Get on your way. He was so big, he actually did an ad for cigarettes and also for not smoking. So he did one for smoking and one for not smoking. Must have been a couple of hundred bucks here or there. I'll do it. Now, tough words from perhaps the finest baseball player the world has ever known, Mickey Mantle. I want my baseball. I want my maple. Mickey called me up a couple of weeks after the commercial was running. George, what a pain in the ass. I said, what's the matter? 
wherever I go, the kids are yelling at me, I want my maple, I want my maple, I want my maple. Everybody wanted to be connected to him, to be a part of him. It was absolute myopic hero worship. He was the most important thing in our lives. Kids were painting number seven on their T-shirts. Everybody had his righty and lefty batting stance down pat. We all tried to run like Mickey. It looked like he was a piston. His arms went up and down instead of this way. We limped like Mickey limped. I used to fake knee injuries when I was a kid. I learned how to long divide so I could know his batting average because I want to know what he was hitting when I went to bed. I wrote a poem about him when I was like 10 or 11 or something. From a pinstripe shirt, his arms do come. Like massive stone, they appear to some. For these are arms that compare with few. When a normal man wanted to make two, and it kind of went on for a while. <laughs> Even when he'd be out at first base, the way he would reach behind his helmet and scoop off his batting helmet from the rear and toss it to the bat boy, so elegant. Nobody could do it like the Mick. Even the name, Mickey Mantle, just floats. When people said that name over and over again, Mickey Mantle. 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 Let's go and watch Mickey Mantle. I'm just glad his name wasn't Cy Schwartzstein. When you say Mickey Mantle, you're saying baseball. He just was like Superman. But the truth is, he was just a regular guy. He just did the little things all the time, and he just had this little smirk on his face. We were getting ready to go out, and Mickey had just uh, combed his hair, and he looked at the mirror, and he goes, boy, you're handsome, he said. <laughs> you know, because he knew I walked in the room, and it was going to get a laugh from me. He had a tremendous sense of humor. I was the first guy to be hair dry in a clubhouse. He put powder in it one day. I turned it on. I turned white. You know, that was metal. He didn't want to be a hero. He just wanted to be Mickey and one of the guys. Try as he might, it was impossible for Mickey Mantle to be just one of anything, let alone one of the guys. His God-given ability and almost accidental charm set him apart. He was a baseball star who eventually became as comfortable and dynamic off the field as he was on it. His eyes were so big and so wide open, he quickly learned that there was a lot of fun to be had in New York City. The other Yankee players took his gee whiz attitude, and they said, all right, kid, we're going to show you the big town. And they took him to the nightclubs in New York, to the Copacabana, to the Latin Quarter, and he became a regular at Toots Shaw's restaurant. They'd go out and hang out at Toots Shore with Sinatra. They felt like they were special, like they owned that town. Watch a movie from the 50s. The star of the show's got a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other. It was cool to drink. They drink, and they chase women. We always had something to do. At about 11 o'clock, I said, I'm going home. I said, I have to catch tomorrow. You guys do what you want. Wait, wait till you talk to Whitey. He'll tell you some stories. They've all been told a hundred times, and I have nothing new to add to it. Beer was in the clubhouse. Bottles of beer all over the place, so he'd have two or three just to replenish his fluids. Well, he's already got a buzz on. He said, well, I was drunk before I left the ballpark. Then I go out and have a couple of drinks and dinner. Now I'm really plastic. They wanted me to stabilize him. Well, there wasn't much I could do with him. We knew there were nights that he was out. He'd walk in the clubhouse, and Hank Bauer and I would say, oh, God, because we could check his eyes that we probably had a bad night, which some of us did in the old days. One night, we were in New Jersey with Yogi Berra and his wife. Mick was really having fun. 
And as we drove out of the parking lot, Yogi screams, Merlin, I wouldn't ride with him. And about two blocks down the street, Mick hits a telephone pole. And I had a concussion because I hit the windshield. I could have been killed. Along the way, it got out of control. Yeah. And of course, Mick had a lot of time to spend in New York by himself because I wasn't there. Merlin Johnson and Mickey Mantle were childhood sweethearts who married soon after Mickey's rookie season of 1951. Two years later, when Mickey Jr. was born, the family bought a home in Dallas. Merlin settled there, while Mickey spent most of his time in New York. As the years passed and the family grew, Mickey continued to drift away, leaving Merlin with the responsibility of raising their four young sons. Mantle was a distant father, the baseball star who never grew up. Of course, the Yankees' clubhouse of that era was just like Neverland, with Billy Martin as its Peter Pan. One of their teammates had a real beautiful girl in Cleveland. Dad and Mickey got home from the clubs, and so they had enough liquid courage in them. They decide they're going to climb around and peek in their teammate's window to see this beautiful girl. There's about a two-foot ledge around the building. I believe they're on the seventh or eighth floor. They decide to climb out the window. Mickey's leading the way. They end up having to go all the way around the corner. Luck has it, the shades are drawn. Oh, come on, Billy, let's go back, says the Mick, and my father tells Mickey that he can't. There's no way he's going to be able to turn around and go back the other way. And they have to continue to walk all the way around the hotel to climb back in their window. Where Mickey was introverted, my father was extroverted. When they were just so close, they would become like brothers. Mickey got a great kick out of Billy's pugnacious personality, and what you did when you were a friend of Billy Martin was go out and drink and raise hell. When I was a kid, I, I didn't really know what to make of it. I just thought it was funny. They would have fights at the Copacabana, and they would be partying, and then the next day they'd win 17 nothing. We were staying in the St. Moritz. We were watching the Honeymooners. Right in the middle of the program, he turned to me, hey, Blanche, he said, do you ever think about dying? And I said, are you really concerned about that? He said, yeah. Mantle's fears were far from unfounded. Early death was in his blood. When he was 13, he watched his grandfather die from Hodgkin's disease. Two of his uncles were also taken young, each before the age of 35, again from Hodgkin's. Mickey was convinced he would meet the same fate, especially when he watched firsthand his father begin to succumb to that same horrible disease during a bittersweet World Series visit. He came to the World Series the first time he ever saw me play baseball in New York. He came to the Series in 1951, and that's when I hurt my knee. DiMaggio was playing center field, and Mickey was in right. And it was a fly ball hit between the two of them. At the last second, Joe hollered, I got it. And Mickey slipped on that drainage thing out in right center field. He just absolutely stopped flat like this. I turned around and said, my God, he's dead. Well, he was taking me to the hospital the next morning. When I got out of the cab, I couldn't walk, and I was leaning on him, and he just keeled over. And that's the first time I had known he was sick. Mantle watched the rest of his first World Series in a hospital room, out with torn cartilage in his knee. In the bed next to him was his dad, who over the next six months deteriorated at the hands of the Mantle family curse. His dad could not lay down, he could not sit down. He was in excruciating pain. It was sad, he didn't last too long after that. He passed away the next May after that World Series. When my dad died, he said, well, it might be a little rough, but we'll make it. I don't know what we would have done if it hadn't been for Mickey after dad died because 
there was us four kids still at home. But we got a check every time he got paid.